humanitarian organizations with unhindered, timely, and safe access to persons from conflict-affected areas of Ukraine that are now in the Russian Federation or in areas of Ukraine occupied by the Russian Federation. Lastly, we urge the international community con to continue supporting citizens and residents of Ukraine who had to flee their homes. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie Madame Brandskeris de son exposé et je donne à présent la parole à Madame Drick. Euh, on ne vous entend pas. Euh, Peut-être qu'il faut-il appuyer sur un bouton. On ne vous entend pas. Le micro. Mr. President, members of the Council, during the six months uh, of the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Center for Civil Liberties, together with the partners from the Tribunal for Putin Initiative, which is the coalition of Ukrainian human rights NGOs, has documented over 17,000 crimes, potential international crimes committed by the Russian army in Ukraine. As of end uh, of August, the database of the initiative contains information of around 30 different types of crimes, including direct attacks and damage of civilian objects, death and injuries caused by shelling, employing weapons causing superfluous injury, damage to buildings dedicated to religion, education, art and science, enforced disappearance of persons, pillaging of an occupied town or place, murder, willful killing of the civilians, and of course, illegal detention and deprivation of liberty of civilians. The latter often takes place during the so-called filtration, which include unlawful practices with which Russia has been implementing in occupied territories of Ukraine during the last eight years, as the monitoring experience of the Center of Civil Liberties reveals. Basically, Russia has scaled this experience and practices to other temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine with the full-scale invasion in February this year. Just to give you the taste of what this process looks like for Ukrainians these days, here are some of the stories of those who passed through filtration and were brave enough to share these stories. Some names are changed for security reasons. Mr. Yakov testified that he was interrogated by the Russian military intelligence officers and Russia controlled forces in occupied Donetsk. When they found out that his wife was donating to Ukrainian army, they called her fascist and Nazi and attempted to take away their child for what they call re-education, just as they often do with children of the parents Russian detained on occupied territories. The desperate parents decided that they would rather kill themselves than give away the child. However, Russians got interested in Yakiv's professional skills. They continued his interrogation by asking questions about defenders of Mariupol Azov battalion. And when Mr. Yakov had nothing to say because he did not belong to Ukrainian military, they started beating him, hitting in the groin over and over again. Then they connected electricity to his neck. And when Mr. Yakov recovered after the electric shock, he started coughing. It turned out that it was uh, his dental fillings. They all fell out during this torture. Lying on the floor, he noticed stains of a brown color. It was blood, but not his but those who were there before him. Then Russians grabbed him and pointed to the long, uh, to the log not far from the handcuff, uh, with handcuffs attached. Um, again, it was all covered with blood, with pieces of white color, uh, resembling fragments of bones. The man was only saved by the arrival of Russian military officers who wanted him to work for them in Mariupol. However, Mr. Yakiv asked to take the family to Russia under the pretext of medical care for his child. And then the whole family managed to escape to Europe. Another story is of a 21-year-old student from Mariupol, Taras Ulyanchenko, who openly speaks about his real name because he has nothing to lose anymore. His father was shot by Russian soldiers. His home, home city was destroyed. And after hiding in the basement for weeks, 
he was taken together with his 80-year-old grandmother who had cancer to go through the filtration twice, first to Donetsk and then to the Russian border. There he was fingerprinted, photographed, interrogated, psychologically pressured by the view of the interrogation of the former Ukrainian military with a Russian wearing civilian clothes with a baseball bat in his hands. He was also asked to refuse the Ukrainian passport, uh, but he denied and kept the passport. Four days later, as soon as it was possible, he was out of Russia and made his way to Georgia and Turkey to Germany. Another story is a 17-year-old musician, Maria Vdovichenko, whose entire family went through the similar humiliating procedure infiltration camp in Mangush, with the only difference that she was also sexually harassed during the interrogation, but avoided violence because Russian soldiers did not find her pretty enough. Maybe the next one will be prettier, they said to her. While her father had to go through all the steps of the humiliating procedure only because he erased his phone before the filtration. And that Russians did not like. Those who have not passed the filtration can be detained in filtration camps for months. From there, they might be sent to detention centers or prisons in the occupied territories of Russia. The taste of what happens there, you can imagine from the testimonies of survivors, like that uh, of a 16-year-old Vadim Buryak, who was detained when attempting to leave Melitopol and kept for three months. He had to live in a prison cell with no even working toilet in it. Almost daily, he would hear the tortures, see the tortured Ukrainian POWs, and then forced to clean torture rooms from blood. And that's in case when these people get uh, out at all, while many like Ivan Kozlov from Kherson, who was detained during the filtration in Crimea, according to the information at our disposal, has been kept at the detention centers in Sevastopol and Simferopol since April 2022. All this time, his relatives had no opportunity to speak to him, learn his condition or get in contact at all. Some civilian hostages are being tortured to admit that they have a relation to Ukrainian military, like from those uh, testimonies provided by the survivor Alexei Dibrovsky, who was taken hostage on the 25th March in the Parisian region, kept in different premises like Melitopol Airport, a shed, then a police station in Melitopol, and then detention center in Kursk in Russia. He and other hostages were beaten by hands, legs, tortured by electricity, forced to crawl the floor with no uh, medical assistance provided at all. Some of these uh, tortures, as he testified, were aiming to force the civilians to admit that they have a relation to the Ukrainian army, as if uh, these hostages Russia needed to prepare as an exchange fund. It is not that rare that in testimonies of those who passed infiltration, there is information that those failing to pass the filtration were killed. And as the recently published satellite uh, images reveal, there are mass graves close to some of the filtration camps, which might mean that some might be killed or tortured to death. All these people who go through so-called filtration procedures find themselves in the position of civilian hostages, humiliated, kept in inhumane conditions, with no access to basic sanitary needs, with no proper access to food or water, no access to medical care, being tortured themselves and witnessing the tortures of others. They have no legal status because according to the international law, they can't be even held in Russia at all. But that's not even all civilian hostages that Russia and Russian controlled groups on occupied territories illegally detain. Many are being kidnapped, taken from their homes. They just disappear from the occupied territories until we find out that they are being detained in one of many detention centers somewhere in occupied territories, Russia or Belarus. And these are not just rare single cases. The Center for Civil Liberties alone, just one human rights organization, has already received information about at least 600 of such cases, often from relatives of these Ukrainians who are being detained. It's a systematic, planned and organized activity. Moreover, based on the information collected by the Center for Civil Liberties during the previous eight years, these filtration practices have not started with the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February uh, this year, 
But instead, Russia has been practicing it in occupied territory since the first military invasion in Ukraine in 2014, but then scaled this experience to all temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. Currently, it is estimated that from dozens of thousands to a hundred of thousands of Ukrainians are kept in filtration camps or detention centers on territories occupied by Russia or Russia itself, which has developed into an organized and branched system of facilities quite extensively covered in the recent report of Conflict Observatory, which coincides um, in many instances with the data that we possess. Basically, Russia has established a zone of complete lawlessness on the occupied territories. And by running fake referendums and declaring these occupied territories independent, Russian government attempts to lift responsibility from itself for monstrous atrocities that are being committed there. These territories are not and have never been independent. They are occupied by Russia, which is fully responsible as the occupying power for adherence to the provisions of the international law on these territories. Instead, however, Russian army under the Russian political and military leadership is completely neglecting, ignoring the provisions of international law or twisting it completely to serve the purpose of its propaganda, basically doing whatever they want. Moreover, Ukraine is um, far not first country uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia has invaded in the last 30 years. But Russia had always got away with it. That's why Russia has to be stopped and Russian war criminals must be brought to justice. Otherwise, these atrocities will continue and hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians will continue to suffer. And Russia will continue to do whatever it wants and invade countries whenever it wants. And if Russia is not stopped, how do you know your country? Russia will not come to liberate first. Next. That's why we call on the Council to create effective mechanisms for monitoring first Russia's compliance with the norms of international law. Namely, termination of illegal detention of Ukrainian citizens who have not passed this so-called filtration. Seize of practices of torture, physical violence, threats and humiliation. Provision of complete and comprehensive information on the location and state of health of detained persons at the request of relatives and official representatives of the state of Ukraine. Provision of all forms of legal protection in the event of official disclosure against these persons, including access to lawyers, international monitors, and the uh, sponsoring country when such is established. And most of all, promote establishment of accountability mechanisms that are necessary to bring uh, Russia and what Russian war criminals to justice. Thank you. Je remercie Madame Drick de son exposé et je vais à présent passer la parole aux membres du Conseil, en commençant par l'Albanie. Monsieur le Président, et je remercie la sous-secrétaire générale Di Carlo, mais aussi Madame Caïs et Madame Drick pour leurs informations perspicaces et utiles mais aussi très troublante. Mr. President, one could think there is hardly any meaningful aspect of the Russian war of choice in Ukraine that we have not discussed in the Council in the course of these long six months. Today's topic is in fact one. Since the beginning of the aggression, strong concerns have been raised, including by some of us, and for good reason, on the alleged deportations, interrogations, and detentions of Ukrainian civilians by Russian and the Russian affiliated forces, a policy and actions that run against the international humanitarian law. These concerns are no longer allegations. They are facts confirmed carefully and painstakingly by international institutions independent agencies, human rights groups, and professional news media based on accurate information by interviews with deported and interrogated persons, as well as additional and concordant resources, including intelligence reports, verified social media postings, and satellite images. Everything is concordant, and the conclusion is beyond doubt and staggering. <laughs> 
Russia is conducting a demographic makeup, in other terms, a social engineering in Ukraine. Mr. President, despite calls and requests, no independent bodies have been allowed to inspect those filtration camps, which for us are an archipelago of unlawfulness, a dehumanizing process, black holes of human rights abuses, where Ukrainians face torture and loyalty tests. Those who have passed through the camps have reported humiliation, verbal abuse, and physical torture, which range from strip searches, electric, electric shocks, and staged mock executions, and Ms. Drick provided spine-chilling details. According to a Human Rights Watch report published recently, Russian and Russian-affiliated officials have forcibly transferred Ukrainian civilians in areas of Ukraine you occupied temporarily by Russia or to the Russian Federation, including in areas very far away. Madam Keres just confirmed forced transfers of adults and children. During the so-called filtration process, biometric data have been collected, including fingerprints, facial images, and personal belongings. They have been interrogated for their relations to military armed forces and their political views as well. Any sign that links anyone to the Ukraine government is an indictment with dire consequences. The report notes that individuals who failed the filtration process were detained, and for some of them, the fate is unknown. There are serious grounds for concern that their lives are at risk if they are still alive. Further, in July, an expert mission of the OEC Moscow mechanism established to investigate alleged violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law committed by Russian forces in Ukraine since 24th of February has identified the establishment and use of the so-called filtration centers. Further, further, based on the analysis of the satellite images, the Humanitarian Research Lab of the Yale University has identif identified 21 sites in the Donetsk Oblast alone affiliated with filtration operations. These are not mere checkpoints. These are makeshift prisons, another phase of the Russia's brutal war in Ukraine. Mr. President, anyone who has studied a bit of history would not fail to notice that filtration camps are rooted in Soviet and Russian history from World War II to the Chechen Wars in the 90s. World-known Russian investigative reporter Anna Politsky Politskovskaya gathered testimony from thousands of Chechen civilians detained in similar centers, revealing brutal interrogation methods, torture, and human rights violations. Despite decades apart, the policy and its aim remain the same. Identify civilians who they believe can assimilate into Russian culture and Russian rule, and punish or remove those who won't. It is just black and white. If you pay allegiance to the occupier, you are free. If not, you are detained and may disappear. This is what is happening to countless Ukrainian civilians. Credible est estimates point to some 1.5 million people processed through these filtration camps. OEC puts that figure even higher, up to 1,700,000 1, Ukrainians as of June, and it has not stopped since. But the main question concerns those who remain unaccounted for. Mr. President, in this bleak picture, the situation of children gleams as a terrifying dark spot. Human rights advocates believe Russians have separated Ukrainian children from their parents at the filtration camps and placed Ukrainian orphans with Russian families. When they do not kill children, and this has happened to hundreds of them so far, they will simply uproot them and deport them to Russia. Imagine for a second the indescribable distress of Tatiana Tolstokor Tolstokorova, who recognized Nastya, her missing three-year-old granddaughter, in a video posted on July 14th on v Contact, the otherwise the Facebook in Russia, being welcomed by adoptive adults in Russia. This seems to have been and become the nightmare for tens of thousands of Ukrainian mothers. Reportedly, Russian adults in Russia who take Ukrainian orphans will receive a stipend more than four times the minimum wage.
Mr. President, the international law is clear. The forcible transfer of civilians is prohibited under international humanitarian law, laws of war, and can be prosecuted as a war crime and a crime against humanity, including the Fourth Geneva Convention. The Russian Federation is a state party to all these instruments, and it violates them just like it does with everything else at will. We call on international organizations, independent agencies, and encourage Ukrainian authorities to collect all the documentation available that may be used in the accountability process. The violation of the international law will not remain unpunished, and crimes committed in Ukraine will hunt those responsible until their last days. Mr. President, there is a lot that has come into the open but about these unlawful policies of Russia in Ukraine. But what we may know may only be the tip of the iceberg. There is certainly significantly much more we don't know, and this, the, this is the bigger story and the bigger worry. This is why, if Russia has nothing to hide, as they claim, it should enable immediate and unrestricted access to the UN bodies, the OHCHR in the first place, but also to international humanitarian actors into the so-called filtration centers and to the forced deportation relocation areas in Russia, where the civilians, the Ukrainian civilians, are being filtered, interrogated, humiliated, denied their rights, and unlawfully detained. Will Russia do that? I thank you. Je remercie le représentant de l'Albanie pour son intervention et je donne la présent la parole à la représentante des États-Unis. Thank you, Mr. President. And also thank you to Under Secretary General De Carlo and Assistant Secretary General Karras for your briefings. And thank you so much, Ms. Drake, for offering a stark and credible view on the situation from a civil society perspective. Colleagues, I want you to imagine for a moment you are a parent in Mariupol. You and your partner are young and healthy. You have a 10-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. You're happy. You're not particularly political, but you love your life in Ukraine. And suddenly, Russia invades. Russian forces bomb your schools and hospitals. They destroy your peaceful city. Still, you've done the best to keep your family safe. You've huddled in shelters. You've tried to survive. And one day, you and your family are trying to scrounge up some food, and you're stopped on the streets by Russian forces. You're escorted against your will to a center to undergo filtration. You're terrified about what happens next because your grandmother told you stories of her friends and neighbors disappearing under the Soviet Union, and even what Russia did to its own citizens during the war in Chechnya. You're separated from your partner and your children. Your personal biometric information is recorded. Your Ukrainian driver's license and passports are confiscated. Your cell phone is searched for perceived anti-Russian messages. You're stripped of your clothes. You are interrogated. You're beaten. You hear gunfire and screams from rooms next door. Others deemed more threatening are being tortured and killed. Because you are of fighting age, you're asked to fight for Russia. When you refuse, you're given a Russian passport and sent deep into Russia against your will, far away from your family and with no means to communicate with anyone you know our love. You've been filtered. This is the picture that many credible reports from diverse sources present of the so-called filtration operations that Russia has set up in Ukraine. We now have eyewitness testimony from victims and increasingly detailed reportings from groups such as Human Rights Watch, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Yale School of Public Health's Humanitarian Research Lab, and you've heard two of our briefers today share this information. Even the Russian state-managed task news agency has reported 
on the many Ukrainians who have been relocated to Russia. And these filtration locations, Russian authorities are proxy search, they interrogate, they coerce, and reportedly sometimes torture subjects. But these horrors are not limited to the centers that have been set up. Filtration may also occur at checkpoints, routine, routine traffic stops, or on the streets. In an interview conducted by Human Rights Watch, a man from Mariupol said he and dozens of Mariupol residents were forced to stay in a schoolhouse under filthy conditions, and that was before they even were taken to undergo filtration. He said many got sick. He said, quote, we felt like hostages. These operations aim to identify individuals Russia deems insufficiently compliant or compatible to its control. And there's mounting and credible evidence that those considered threatening to Russian control because of perceived pro-Ukrainian leanings are disappeared or further detained. One eyewitness said that she overheard a Russian soldier say, I shot at least 10 people who had not passed filtration. Estimates from a variety of sources, including the Russian government, indicate that Russian authorities have interrogated, detained, forcibly deported between 900,000 and 1.6 million Ukrainian citizens from their homes to Russia, often to isolated regions in the Far East. And I want to be clear, the United States has information that officials from Russia's presidential administration are overseeing and coordinating these filtration operations. And we are further aware that Russian presidential administration officials are providing lists of Ukrainians to be targeted for filtration and receiving reports on the scope and the progress of operations. Filtered. The word does not begin to convey the horror and the depravity of these premeditated policies. Just look at how Russia is treating Ukrainian children. Estimates indicate that thousands of children have been subject to filtration, some separated from their families and taken from orphanages before being put up for adoption in Russia. The United States has information that over the course of July alone, more than 1,800 children were transferred from Russian-controlled areas of Ukraine to Russia. Of course, I need not remind this council that the forcible transfer of de deportation of protected persons from occupied territories to the territory of the occupier is a grave breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilians and constitutes a war crime. We should take a moment to consider the fate of those who do not pass filtration. The evidence, evidence is growing every day that thousands of Ukrainians deemed threatening due to their potential affiliation with the Ukrainian army, territorial defense forces, media government, and civil society groups are reportedly being detained or simply disappearing. So why are they doing this? Why are they confiscating Ukrainian identity documents? Why are they forcing Ukrainians to fill out Russian passport applications? Why are they intimidating locals and deporting anyone deemed threatening? Why are they systematically cataloging Ukrainians moving through the system? Why is Russia appointing officials in occupied areas, imposing its educational curriculum in schools and trying to get Ukrainian citizens to apply for Russian passports? Why are Russian forces and proxies doing their best to erase the living memory of Ukraine? The reason is simple, to prepare for an attempted annexation. The goal is to change sentiments by force to provide a fraudulent veneer of legitimacy for the Russian occupation and eventual purported annexation of even more Ukrainian territory. This effort to fabricate these facts on the ground is the predicate 
to sham referenda. It is part of the Russian playbook for Ukraine that we've been warning council members about since even the beginning of the war. These referenda will attempt to create a false semblance of legality and public support, so Russia feels it can annex her son, Zaporizhia, and other regions of Ukraine. Of course, we will never recognize any efforts by Russia to change Ukraine's borders by force. We must hold the perpetrators of these atrocities to account. We must respond as an international community, an international community that still respects the UN Charter. We know what Russia will say about all of this. They will deny, deny, deny. But there's a simple way to know if any of this is true. Let the United Nations in. Give the independent observers access. Give NGOs access. Allow humanitarian access. Let the world see what is going on. As Security Council members, we're here to promote international peace and security and uphold the UN Charter. At a minimum, I hope each of us here today acknowledges that all persons subject to filtration need access to UN and humanitarian agencies as soon as possible so that we can verify their well-being as we heard today from OHCHR. Until Russia provides that access, we will have to rely on the evidence we have accumulated and the brave testimony of survivors. The picture they paint alongside the mounting reports is chilling. Colleagues, there will come a day when we are gathered in this council to condemn Russia's, uh, the Russian Federation's attempts to annex more of Ukraine's territory. And I will ask that you remember what you've heard here today. No one, no one will be able to say they were not warned. Thank you. Je remercie la représentante des États-Unis pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole à la représentante du Royaume-Uni. Thank you, President. And I join the previous two speakers in thanking Under Secretary General De Carlo. Assistant Secretary General Keres and Ms. Alexandra Drick for their briefings. As we've discussed, today we meet to discuss the emerging evidence of further potential Russian violations and abuses of international law. We are deeply concerned by reporting by the UN, the OSCE, and civil society organizations that Russia is systematically detaining, processing, and deporting Ukrainian men, women, and children with chilling echoes from European history. As we've heard, civilians reportedly face interrogation body searches, stripping, invasive data collection, ill treatment, and torture while passing through filtration. Those who are deemed most threatening are reportedly held indefinitely in detention centers, while others, including unaccompanied children, are forcibly deported to Russia. Some simply disappear. So we call on the Russian Federation to allow the UN and other relevant international organizations immediate, full, and unhindered access to those held in filtration camps and detention centers. And for these reports, to be fully investigated to ensure that those responsible can be held to account. We are concerned too that Russia 
may be using forced deportations and displacement in an attempt forcibly to change the demographic makeup of parts of Ukraine. What does this tell us about Russia's war? First, it tells us about their method and their disregard for the rules that we agreed and observe here at the UN, the collective rules that bind us together. Russia acts as if the Charter and international humanitarian law do not apply to them. Second, it confirms that this is not just an attempt to destroy Ukraine's democracy, but also Ukrainian identity and culture. Alleged denazification is a cover for de-Ukrainianization and annexation. Finally, it confirms what has been abundantly clear over the last six months. Russia's army is not being welcomed as it enters Ukrainian territory. This is a war of conquest, a war of occupation, a war of oppression, and a war to eliminate Ukraine. So yet again, we call on the Russian Federation to observe fully its obligations under international law and to bring an end to its illegal invasion of Ukraine. Thank you, President. Je remercie la représentante du Royaume-Uni de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Chine. Shen 我们必须加紧行动有关当事方应严格遵守国际人道法为数百万难民提供的安全庇护和整个地区上亿人的健康福祉驻留在核电站继续开展工作鼓励机构就相关问题同各方保持沟通中方始终将乌克兰的人道局势 
放在心上。先后提出防止乌克兰出现大规模人道主义危机的六点倡议和国际粮食安全合作倡议。我们鼓励俄罗斯、乌克兰就人道问题保持沟通合作。支持联合国和国际人道机构在中立、公正、非政治化的原则基础上，向乌克兰和周边国家提供人道援助。一直呼吁并推动乌克兰和俄罗斯的粮食、化肥重回国际市场。中国政府已经向乌克兰提供了三批人道救援物资，用行动给深陷冲突的乌克兰人民带去温暖。希望我们援助的儿童奶粉、棉被、防潮垫和其他人道物资，可以帮助更多的人度过即将到来的寒冬。主席先生，历史反复证明，外交努力、谈判沟通是化解冲突、结束危机的唯一正确出路。中方再次呼吁有关当事方保持对话接触。探索政治解决的可能性，为早日停火止战、恢复和平稳定积累条件。所有各方都应摒弃政治私利，停止激化矛盾，停止制造分裂，停止鼓吹对抗，为化解乌克兰危机做出切实的努力。谢谢主席。Je remercie le représentant de la Chine de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant, à la représentante de l'Inde, si c'est possible. Mr. President, allow me to thank you for convening this meeting on this important topic. Let me also thank the briefers for their presentations. We are witnessing today the debilitating impact of conflicts on humanitarian situations across global landscapes, be it in Afghanistan, Yemen, Mali, Sudan, or Ukraine. The report of the Secretary General paints a distressing picture of civilian suffering. Over 11,000 civilian casualties in various conflicts in 2021, with over 45% of these being in our neighbourhood. In Afghanistan alone, more than 140 million people are reeling under conflict-induced hunger. 84 million people being forcibly displaced, with women and children forming the large majority of internally displaced persons. It is a matter of concern that parties to armed conflicts seem to view the civilian population and civilian infrastructure as legitimate targets. Vulnerable groups, including women, children, and minorities. As well as indispensable civilian infrastructure, hospitals, and irreplaceable cultural heritage, have been among the several collateral casualties of attacks in recent armed conflicts. The Council would recall that since the commencement of the conflict in Ukraine, India has been consistently calling for an immediate cessation of hostilities and to an end to violence. Going forward, we continue to emphasise dialogue and diplomacy as the only way forward. It is regrettable that the situation in Ukraine has not shown any significant improvement since the Council last discussed the conflict in Ukraine and its humanitarian consequences. The security situation remains serious, as do the humanitarian consequences. Reports of civilian killings in Bucha were deeply disturbing. We very much hope that the international community will continue to respond positively to the call for humanitarian assistance. We support calls. Urging for guarantees of safe passage to deliver essential humanitarian and medical supplies, India has recently dispatched its 12th consignment of humanitarian aid to Ukraine. This humanitarian aid and assistance is in keeping with the human-centric approach of the government of India, a central tenet of our national beliefs and values, which perceive the whole world as one family. Let me assure the Council that India will continue to work with the international community and partner countries to mitigate the economic hardships that are resulting from this conflict. The impact of the Ukraine conflict is not just limited to Europe. In particular, the conflict is exacerbating concerns over food, 
fertilizer and fuel security, particularly in the developing countries. It is necessary for all of us to adequately appreciate the importance of equity, affordability and accessibility. India has been approached for the supply of wheat and sugar by many countries and we are responding positively. In the last three months alone, India has exported more than 1.8 million tons of wheat to countries in need, including to Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan and Yemen. Allow me to once again reiterate the importance of the UN guiding principles on humanitarian assistance, that is humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence. These measures should never be politicized. We continue to emphasize, Mr. President, to all member states that the global order be anchored on international law, the UN Charter, and respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. Thank you. Je remercie la représentante de l'Inde de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant du Brésil. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to thank USG Rosemary Di Carlo, ASG Ilzi Brands Keris, and Ms. Alexandra Drick for their briefings. Mr. President, two weeks ago, this council met to discuss the situation in Ukraine after six months of conflict. The report USG Rosemary Di Carlo presented to us on that occasion already gave us a bleak scenario. Tens of thousands of unconfirmed deaths and millions of refugees and internally displaced persons. The humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate and continued hostilities during winter could have dire consequences, disproportionately affecting vulnerable groups, women and children. There are signs of an intensification of hostilities in various parts of the Ukrainian territory, such as the Kherson region, where fighting has in intensified. This worrying trend ignores the risks to the safety of heavily populated areas and to the integrity of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Even more disheartening, is the fact that there are no signs of any engagement in peace negotiations. In recent weeks, we have heard that the two sides are preparing for a long-term conflict with the mobilization of additional troops and resources. This decision will have serious impacts on both societies and their economies with unforeseeable consequences for the next generations and rippling effects for the world at large. Mr. President, we have in mind the words of the distinguished permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates at the session held last August 24th. There is value in the Council's meetings on Ukraine when they are complemented by action. Action, in this case, should mean opening the path to a negotiated solution that ends the suffering of millions and eliminates the risks to food and energy security in other countries, especially in the developing world. Brazil strongly condemns the use of force to resolve disputes between states. We reiterate our call for the immediate cessation of hostilities. We defend the territorial integrity of all states and the respect for the security concerns of all parties. Isolating any of the parties and closing the doors to dialogue will not bring solutions to the conflict. The grain and fertilizer agreements concluded in Istanbul in July and the arrival of IAEA inspectors at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant last week show that realistic and pragmatic negotiations and mutual concessions are the best way to achieve peace. Respect for international law and for the UN Charter must guide the actions of states and the practice of this Council. 
Mr. President, we urge the parties to refrain from escalating the conflict and to cease hostilities. We add our voice to that of other council members in favor of a political solution and call on the leaders of both countries to prioritize the well-being of their populations. I thank you. Je remercie le représentant du Brésil pour sa déclaration et donne maintenant la parole à la représentante du Ghana. Madam President, thank you for giving me the floor. At the outset, I would like to thank Madam Rosemary Di Carlo, Under Secretary General for the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and Madam Brands Keris, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights and Head of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights for their briefings. I also thank the Civil Society Representative, Ms. Alexandra Drake, for her contributions to the Council's discussions. Since the beginning of the war in February this year, and in only a period of six months, at least 14 million people are estimated to have been forcibly displaced from their normal places of abode. Close to 8 million have sought refuge in neighboring countries, while some 7 million more have been internally displaced. Although some Ukrainian nationals have crossed back into Ukrainian territory, the numbers pale in comparison to those who are compelled to leave their homes on a daily basis. The situation, which has been infamously described as the world's largest and fastest evolving displacement crisis since the Second World War, is alarming and calls for urgent and concerted international action to help end the war that has become the driving force behind the mass displacement of persons from Ukraine. Ghana is concerned that women and children are the most affected by the war and account for the greatest portion of displaced persons. Naturally, many of these women are pregnant, have children, or suffer some form of disability or vulnerability. This council has also in previous briefings received information about human rights abuses, including conflict-related sexual violence suffered by the displaced women and children of Ukraine. We are disheartened by the realization that many of those who have been displaced will not be able to return to their homes and the lives they once lived as a result of the extensive damage and destruction caused to several cities and residential facilities across Ukraine. Despite the grim outlook, we note with appreciation the essential support mechanisms and humanitarian assistance being offered by the United Nations and its affiliate humanitarian agencies, as well as civil society organizations. We also commend those neighboring countries that continue to receive millions of people into their territory and provide them with the needed assistance, notwithstanding their own internal circumstances and challenges. These countries must be granted additional support where possible to enhance their response capacity and ensure that adequate protection and assistance are extended to those who now find themselves as refugees. We recommend that humanitarian assistance extended to the displaced persons should include counseling and psychosocial services to help those who have been traumatized by the experience of the war. Children must also be protected and their best interests prioritized at all times. Mr. President, Ghana condemns all acts of rights of human rights abuses against civilians, including the reported cases of filtration processes and other acts which could possibly amount to war crimes. Filtration operations are inhumane and constitute violations of international humanitarian law and human rights laws. In this vein, we call for thorough, impartial, and independent investigations of such reports and allegations of abuses to establish the facts and ensure accountability on the part of perpetrators and justice for the victims. The attacks on civilian populated areas and the destruction of civilian infrastructure are not only unjust, they are unacceptable and must cease from continuing. We call upon the warring side to comply with their obligations under international law, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. Let me emphasize that the cessation of hostilities is crucial 
to stem the displacement and other humanitarian crises in Ukraine. The war must end now. We reiterate our call to the Russian Federation to immediately and unconditionally withdraw its forces from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. Ghana maintains the view that there can be no military solution to the war. And unless the warring sides refocus their attention and resources from the battlefield to the table of negotiations and diplomatic approaches, the several crises brought about by the war will continue to evolve and further threaten global peace and security. In reaffirming Ghana's unwavering support for the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine and its people, I wish to reiterate our principled position not to recognize any unilateral annexation of territory through the threat or use of force by any one state against the other. Finally, we urge the members of this council to prioritize the interests of the ordinary people of Ukraine as we work towards an early and comprehensive solution that would secure peace and stability in Ukraine. I thank you. Je remercie la représentante du Ghana de sa déclaration et donne maintenant la parole à la représentante de la Norvège. Thank you, President. Let me first thank USD, De Carlo, ASG Keris, and civil society representative Alexandra Dirk for their briefings. There can be no doubt about the significant, tragic humanitarian consequences of Russia's war against Ukraine. Russia's illegal invasion violates the fundamental principle of the UN Charter and the, and the legal norms of the world order. Russia must withdraw its troop and this war must stop. The number of civilian casualty amassed is alarming and unacceptable. As we have heard, over 7 million have crossed the border fleeing Russia's grueling war, seeking protection in neighboring and other countries. Roughly the same number are internally displaced in Ukraine. Behind these numbers are real people, families, children, and persons with, with disabilities. They all need protection, health services, and education. The restoration of family links is of utmost importance and we must prevent and combat human trafficking and other abuses of those in dire need of protection and assistance. All parties have an obligation to protect civilians and to safeguard and ensure their human rights and fundamental freedoms. Russia's warfare in urban and populated areas and the use of heavy explosive weapons is destroying homes school and hospitals. It is important that we support Ukraine's reconstruction effort so that the many millions of forcibly displaced persons one day can return to their homes in Ukraine. And humanitarian and development actors must be engaged in this important work. President, we are deeply worried about the reports of forcibly transfer of civilians to Russia and territory occupied by Russia and of filtration facilities run by Russia. We are alarmed by reports that civilians appear to be arbitrarily deprived of the liberty at such facilities. And there is a growing body of independent information indicating serious human rights violations and abuses against civilian detainees and prisoners of war at these sites. These reports emphasize the importance of all parties engaging in identifying and recovering missing persons. And appropriate humanitarian actors must be given unhindered access to all places of detention in accordance with international humanitarian law. 
We welcome the update today by uh, Rosemary Di Carlo on the fact-finding mission established by the Secretary General pursuant to the incident of 29 July at the det detention facility near the village of Volnvika. The mission must be allowed to conduct its important work. We also recall that all measures aimed at altering the demographic composition of an occupied territory are prohibited according to international humanitarian law and may constitute war crimes. We reiterate our demand that civilians must be protected and international humanitarian law and international human rights law fully respected and implemented. Civilians forcibly transferred who wish to return must be allowed to do so. Humanitarian actors must be ensured access to the many need and they must be protected against attack. Norway condemns the recent attack on the base of the Ukrainian Red Cross in Slovenyansk. President, Russia's war against Ukraine also has global consequences with surging fuel and energy prices and increasing food insecurity. We commend the Secretary General for his tireless effort to promote dialogue and negotiation between the parties. The most effective way to ease the devastating humanitarian impact of this war is to stop it. Russia, Russia chose to start this war. Russia can also choose to end it. Thank you. Je remercie la représentante de la Norvège de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Fédération de Russie. Господин председатель. Господин председатель. Господин председатель. Мы приняли к сведению информацию предоставленную Розмари Ди Карло и Ильзой Бранс Керрис выслушали также очередные измышления от известной пропагандистки бывшего советника министру обороны Украины Александра Дрик. Сегодняшнее заседание, созданное по запросу Соединенных Штатов и Албании, имеет шансы, все шансы, стать новой вехой в дезинформационной кампании, развязанной Украиной и ее западными спонсорами против нашей страны. Тактика Запада, ведущего на Украине гибридную войну против России до последнего украинца, нам понятна. Любым способом очернить Российскую Федерацию и проводимую нами специальную военную операцию. Грязные методы западных пропагандистов нам тоже хорошо знакомы. Достаточно вспомнить очевидные постановки или провокации в Буче, Краматорске, Кременчуге, Мариуполе, опровергаемые все новыми свидетельствами, которые на Западе всеми силами стараются утаить от внимания широкой публики. Теперь нам меняется в вину некие жестокие фильтрационные мероприятия, которые мы якобы осуществляем в отношении украинских граждан. Я бы хотел спросить нашу американскую коллегу, она, правда, уже покинула заседание, но я думаю, ей передадут мой вопрос. Сюжет какого фильма «Ужас» вы нам сегодня пересказывают? Какой, как, сюжет какого фильма ужаса вы нам сегодня пересказывает? Вы хоррор фильм. Мы такого фильма не видели. Это фильм, подготовленный Украинским министерством пропаганды. И когда в таком случае он выйдет на экран? По поводу так называемой фильтрации. Прежде всего, не очень понятно, о чем вообще идет речь, поскольку сам термин «фильтрация» не имеет четкого определения в международном гуманитарном праве. Если речь идет о выявлении среди желающих выехать в Россию украинских граждан, боевиков национальных батальонов или солдат ВСУ, причастных к преступлениям против мирного населения, то это нормальная практика для любой армии мира. Лучше других профильтрационные мероприятия могут рассказать как раз американские коллеги, запросившие это заседание. Взять хотя бы начатую предыдущей администрации программу высылки в Мексику десятков тысяч вынужденных переселенцев, подавших прошение о предоставлении убежища в США. Мигранты содержались в нечеловеческих условиях, лишенные права на юридическое представительство их интересов, 
а также на справедливое судебное разбирательство. При этом американские власти зачастую разделяли семьи, направляя детей и родителей в разные центры содержания. Зафиксировано более двух с половиной тысяч таких случаев. Много лет незаконно содержатся в заключении без суда и следствия узники тюрьмы Гуантанова, пожалуй, из самого темного пятна на изрядно испачканной правочеловеческой репутации США. До сих пор никто не понес ответственности из-за применения пыток и жестокое обращение с заключенными в секретных тюрьмах ЦРУ, которые в 2000-е годы действовали в том числе и в европейских странах. Хотел бы еще раз спросить свою американскую коллегу или просто коллег из делегации Соединенных Штатов, так в порядке любопытства. Соединенные Штаты допускали правозащитные организации системы ООН? Посещали ли представители, например, УВКПЧ, узников в тюрьме Гуантанам? На этом фоне особенно циничны попытки инициаторов дискуссии под правозащитным соусом заставить несведущую публику поверить в существование жутких лагерей, где пытают мирных украинских граждан обманом или принуждением, заставляя их уехать в Россию. И те, кто продвигает подобные инсинуации, попросту не лады с фактами или здравым смыслом. Против этого и элементарная статистика, причем международная. Российская Федерация, как известно, крупнейшая страна, реципиент украинских беженцев. Всего в России из Украины, Донецкой Народной Республики и Луганской Народной Республики прибыли более 3 миллионов 700 тысяч человек, из которых 600 тысяч детей. Если вычесть из этого числа обладающих российскими паспортами граждан ДНР и ЛНР, то численность граждан Украины, выявших в Россию, составляет, по оценкам Управления ООН по делам беженцев, свыше 2 миллионов 400 тысяч человек. И эти люди содержатся не в тюрьмах, таких как, например, Гуантанова, а живут свободно и добровольно в России. Никто не запрещает им перемещаться или уезжать из страны. Это подтвердило сегодня даже представителю ВКПЧ. Вы всерьез думаете, что такое количество людей можно привести насильно и заставить молчать? Многие из них пишут о своих впечатлениях и оценках в соцсетях, дают интервью, высказывают слова благодарности нашей стране. Из их публикаций понятно, что люди бегут из Украины из страха за свою жизнь, спасаясь от преступного режима, который не давал им эвакуироваться и использовал их в качестве живого щита. На территории 85 субъектов Российской Федерации действует свыше 1500 пунктов временного размещения общей вместимостью более 95 тысяч человек. Для доставки беженцев к местам временного проживания выделяется железнодорожный транспорт. Для этого задействовано 38 железнодорожных составов. Функционируют телефонные горячие линии, обрабатывающие ежедневно свыше 250 обращений граждан. Беженцам и переселенцам оказывается финансовая, юридическая, психологическая и медицинская помощь. Особое внимание уделяем судьбе детей. Им предоставляются все возможности для продолжения учебы в школе. К сожалению, далеко не все дети в Донецкой и Луганской народных республиках с праздничным настроением пошли в школу 1 сентября. Из-за ежедневных обстрелов городов ДНР и ЛНР со стороны ВСУ в ряде школ по решению властей пока действует режим дистанционного обучения. К вопросу о при приватности детей, о которой говорила сегодня госпожа Бранс Керрис. Нас поражает, что рассуждая об этом, ООНовские чиновники уже который раз пытаются не замечать тот факт, что украинский сайт «Миротворец» Писмейка публикует личные данные не только взрослых, но и несовершеннолетних, угрожая им расправой. Мы уже информировали ООН, в частности ЮНИСЕФ, о том, что в базе данных этого экстремистского ресурса более 340 детей, включая 13-летнюю луганчанку Фаину Савенкову, с которой представители ЮНИСЕФ пока так и не встретились – несмотря на дававшиеся ими заверения и обещания. Естественно, на границе России, с Россией вынужденные переселенцы проходят регистрацию, после чего нуждающимся помогают добраться до стационарных, стационарных пунктов временного размещения. Обращаем внимание тех, кто пытается подменять понятие. Прибывающие в Россию украинцы и жители ДНР и ЛНР проходят процедуру регистрации, а не фильтрации. 
Насколько мы можем судить, схожие процедуры применяются в Польше и других странах Евросоюза в отношении украинских беженцев. Но об этом они пусть расскажут сами. Уважаемые коллеги, насколько далеко от реальности ушли наши западные коллеги в своих фантазиях о насильственном вывозе украинцев на территории России, видно по ситуации на земле. Даже западные СМИ не могут игнорировать тот факт, что огромное число украинских граждан стремятся правдами или неправдами попасть из Украины на освобожденные России территории. Длинная очередь выстроилась на контрольно-пропускном пункте в Запорожье, через который ежедневно до 700 человек возвращаются домой, узнав от друзей и близких объективную информацию о мирной жизни в их родных городах и селах. В этом, в частности, могли убедиться эксперты МГТ, которые по пути на Запорожскую АЭС прошли эту очередь и имели возможность поговорить с простыми людьми. Это наглядный показатель того, что очень многие украинцы уже сейчас предпочитают жить с Россией, не веря коррумпированному и преступному киевскому режиму. Если уже говорить о насильственных действиях против мирного населения, то на ум приходят как раз усилия киевских властей. С начала августа Украина проводит так называемую обязательную эвакуацию населения из остающихся под ее контролем районов ДНР и ряда областей страны. Людей лишают не только права выбора направления эвакуации, но зачастую и самой возможности остаться на родных местах, даже если им ничего не угрожает. Тех, которые все-таки решают не уезжать, пугают неотвратимым наказанием за сотрудничество с российской стороной. Извращенные нормы украинского законодательства о так называемом коллаборационизме позволяют привлечь к ответственности даже за получение продуктов питания от российских властей. Или, например, за решение учителя продолжить преподавать в школе в освобожденном районе. Не хотят ли западные, да и ООНовские защитники прав человека обратить внимание на эти законы военного времени, так называемые законы военного времени, и то, как они применяются киевским режимом? Кроме того, вне вашего поля зрения остаются теракты киевских диверсантов в отношении представителей местных властей освобожденных территорий. Людей, которые обеспечивают жизнедеятельность городов и работу коммунальных служб на благо гражданского населения. На днях взорвали автомобиль с руководителем администрации Бердянска Артемом Бардиным. Он погиб. 24 августа убит глава временной гражданской администрации населенного пункта Михайловка в Запорожской области Иван Сушко. В момент взрыва в машине погибшего была и его дочь, которую он вез в детский сад. Она по счастливой случайности выжила. Именно так, видимо, Киев представляет себе партизанскую войну, которую нам обещали с самого начала специальной военной операции. Однако с учетом реальных настроений жителей освобожденных территорий и нового выхода, кроме как прибегать к тактике убийств и запугивания, у режима Зеленского просто не остается. Наконец, утверждение наших бывших западных партнеров о жестоких, жестких фильтрационных процедурах, которые, которым якобы подвергаются украинцы по пути в Россию, разбиваются в дребезги на примере свободных перемещений украинских агентов, причастных к убийству молодого российского журналиста Дарьи Дугина. Напомню здесь вкратце основные факты. Разыскиваемые по обвинению в этом подлом убийстве и террористическом акте гражданка Украины Наталья Вовк, она же Шабан, практически за месяц до совершения преступления, 23 июля, совершенно спокойно въехала со своей 12-летней дочерью Софии Шабан на территории России на своем автомобиле. Как видно из опубликованных кадров видеосъемки, на границе ее продержали несколько минут. Где же были те самые фильтрационные мероприятия и допросы, которые Россия якобы проводит в отношении всех въезжающих в нашу страну украинцев? В Москве Наталья Вовк спокойно разъезжала на своем автомобиле, сняла городскую квартиру и гараж, а 20 августа организовала теракт, жертвой которого стала Дугина. После совершения этого подлого преступления украинка вместе с дочерью тут же направились на границу с Эстонией и спокойно пересекли, пересекли ее опять-таки без каких-либо фильтрационных процедур. Аналогично из Эстонии в Россию и обратно без проблем перемещался сообщник террористский гражданин Украины Богдан Цыганенко. Хочу задать нашим западным коллегам вопрос. Как украинские преступники могли дважды спокойно пересечь российскую границу, если наши так называемое полицейское государство, как многие из вас утверждают, возвело для украинских, украинских граждан сеть фильтрационных лагерей. И как стыкуются массовые добровольные перемещения украинцев в Россию с обвинением в их насильственной депортации. 
Не кажется ли вам, господа, что вы попросту в очередной раз заврались? Достойно сожалению, что в компанию по очернению нашей страны включились и претендующие на объективность правозащитной организации. В одном таком недавно опубликованном докладе, который сегодня широко цитировался, содержится необоснованное обвинение в наш адрес. Легенда о массовых фильтрационных мероприятиях базируется на опросах нескольких десятков человек, многие из которых вообще не выезжали в Россию, а другие подтвердили, что сделали это добровольно. А чего же авторы при огромном, при огромном числе украинских беженцев ограничились этими разрозненными и выборочными показаниями? Они поинтересовались у сотен тысяч, которые бежали от конфликта в России, как им жилось эти годы и месяцы под обстрелами ВСУ и какие процедуры они проходили при пересечении границы. Насколько, в принципе, могут быть беспристрастны правозащитники, работающие только с одной из сторон конфликта, которая, помимо прочего, установила тотальную цензуру на своей территории? Упоминание сегодня в докладах Human Rights Watch не может и не должно никого вводить в заблуждение. Мы прекрасно видели, что происходило с Amnesty International, которую заклевали за попытку показать реальную, а не выдуманную картину использования ВСУ гражданских объектов в военных целях. Получается, что правда нашим западным коллегам не нужна даже от правозащитников. Им нужно от них лишь то, что обеляет прогнивший режим Зеленского и бросает тень на Россию. Господин председатель, мы не против обсуждать происходящее на Украине. В ходе специальной военной операции скрывается настолько много фактов преступной деятельности Киева и его западных сподвижников, что можно обсуждать их хоть каждый день. Но мы за то, чтобы говорить о реальных, а не выдуманных проблемах. И раз уж мы сегодня потеряли время, обсуждая очередные домыслы и фантазии, то предлагаем завтра обсудить настоящие угрозы международному миру и безопасности, порожденные поставками иностранными государствами, вооружений и продукции военного назначения на Украину. В качестве докладчика мы хотели бы видеть заместителя генера... генсекретаря по вопросам разоружения Изумина Комицу, а также представителя гражданского общества. Мы немедленно направим соответствующий запрос французскому председательству. Благодарю вас. Je remercie le représentant de la Fédération de Russie de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant du Kenya. Thank you, President. I thank Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo and Assistant Secretary General Ilse Keris for their updates on the situation in Ukraine. I also thank Ms. Alexandra Drick for her insights. President, we must always go beyond enforcing international law in the conduct of war by appreciating that the greater evil is war itself. The reason being that war inevitably leads to the suffering of civilians. One of the most frequent harms is forced displacement and its domino-like effect on food insecurity, the destruction of livelihoods, the outbreak of disease, sexual abuse, denial of schooling for children, and forced labor, to mention a few. The war in Ukraine has generated the fastest and largest mass displacements since the Second World War. 6.9 million internally displaced and 7 million refugees. Last month alone, more than 330,000 people, mostly from the east and south of the country, where violence has been raging, were displaced. We commiserate, especially with the most vulnerable Ukrainians who have been forced to flee their homes in response to a war against the most basic laws of international conduct, including the provisions of the UN Charter. The claim that some of the forcefully displaced are being subjected to filtration processes is serious and alarming. We call for independent investigation into these allegations to establish the facts upon which this council can take appropriate actions. In this regard, the relevant United Nations agencies should be granted access to those that have been forcibly displaced, particularly those in or have been 
in the alleged filtration camps. Most critically, President, is the urgent need to prevent the creation of new waves of forced displacements, which would certainly worsen the humanitarian situation. More should be done to provide humanitarian assistance and ensure the safety and protection of civilians from war-related violations, including forced displacements, particularly in besieged cities in the east and south of Ukraine. Mr. President, even as we discuss the plight and fate of those forcibly displaced by the conflict in Ukraine, we recall the International Day for People of African Descent that took place on 30 August 2022. On this day, the need to combat the multiple forms of discrimination and violations against people of African descent were underscored. We vividly recall the differential treatment Africans and people of African descent received when they, like millions others, were seeking to escape when the war against Ukraine broke out. What transpired then still represents a call on all states to review their laws and practices to address racial discrimination and uphold their duty to treat migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers mm. with the dignity they deserve. Mr. President, Kenya reiterates once again that although it is going through grave challenges, multilateralism as anchored in the United Nations, including this esteemed body, remains our hope and bulwark against war. We therefore continue to call for cessation of the conflict in Ukraine and a resort to diplomacy. This is the only viable avenue to resolve this conflict, which continues to pose a grave threat to international peace and security. I thank you. Je remercie le représentant du Kenya pour sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant du Mexique. Gracias, Presidente. Agradezco a la subsecretaria general Di Carlo y a la subsecretaria Brand Keris y a la señora Drick la información que nos han compartido. La escalada del conflicto armado en Ucrania ha dejado un gran número de víctimas civiles y la destrucción de infraestructura básica con graves consecuencias, como todos sabemos. Esto ha forzado a millones de personas a abandonar sus hogares en busca de protección y asistencia. Muchos de ellos, en calidad de refugiados, han cruzado las fronteras a países vecinos y otros se encuentran desplazados en el interior de Ucrania. Los números pueden fluctuar, pero la realidad en el terreno es que millones de personas no han podido retornar a sus lugares de origen. El desplazamiento masivo de personas ha generado una serie de retos para los países de acogida, cuya solidaridad reconocemos porque ha permitido que se ofrezca atención a millones de personas. México hace un llamado a todas las partes a respetar el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos, el derecho internacional en materia de refugiados y desplazados internos, así como el derecho internacional humanitario y en particular las cuatro convenciones de Ginebra de 1949 y su primer protocolo adicional de 1977. Conviene recordar que de conformidad con el derecho internacional humanitario, las partes de un conflicto armado internacional no pueden deportar o trasladar a la fuerza a la población civil de un territorio ocupado. Esto forma parte del cuarto convenio de Ginebra y del derecho internacional consuetudinario. Su violación constituye un crimen de guerra. Presidente, lo que se vive en Ucrania es una crisis en constante evolución, por lo que detectar nuevas necesidades y mitigar amenazas para grupos vulnerables constituye un reto y una prioridad.
Diversas agencias de las Naciones Unidas y organizaciones humanitarias han advertido sobre los riesgos que enfrentan, en particular, algunos grupos. Permítase me mencionar brevemente a tres de ellos. Uno, las mujeres. Hace algunos meses escuchamos de ONU Mujeres sobre los riesgos de salud pública que enfrentan las mujeres en la región. La representante especial Patten ya advirtió sobre el impacto que tienen las hostilidades en la disrupción de los servicios para víctimas de violencia sexual e insistió en la importancia de hacer frente a la amenaza que supone el tráfico de personas para fines de explotación sexual y de prostitución. Por ello, creemos que las respuestas y las estrategias de toda acción humanitaria deben tener una clara perspectiva de género. Segundo, niñas y niños. Tanto ACNUR como UNICEF han sido inequívocos al señalar que es primordial asegurar que se lleve a cabo la inmediata identificación, registro, protección y cuidado adecuado de menores no acompañados o separados y evitar adopciones durante o inmediatamente después de una emergencia. Tercero, adultos mayores y personas con discapacidad. Los 2.7 millones de personas con discapacidad en Ucrania tienen acceso muy limitado a información de emergencia, refugios, servicios de salud o redes de apoyo. Se trata de un grupo que enfrenta graves dificultades para acceder a servicios que le permitan atender condiciones urgentes o enfermedades preexistentes que no se están atendiendo. Presidente, México exhorta a que se tomen todas las medidas necesarias para asegurar que cualquier civil desplazado cuente con refugio seguro, alimentación y servicios de salud. Frente a la información que se ha traído esta tarde al Consejo de Seguridad sobre los llamados procesos de filtración, consideramos indispensable que la ONU pueda acceder a estos sitios sin restricciones para que complemente de manera objetiva y rigurosa la información pertinente. Concluyo reiterando que la única manera de resolver todas estas lamentables circunstancias que imperan en el terreno no va a ser concesiones como las que hemos tenido y la que estamos teniendo en estos momentos. La única forma va a ser alcanzar el cese inmediato de las hostilidades y para ello es urgente avanzar en la vía diplomática con un mayor compromiso de la comunidad internacional. Muchas gracias. Je remercie le représentant du Mexique de cette déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Irlande. Thank you, Mr. President, and also thank you to USG De Carlo and ASG Brands Keras for their very concerning briefings, and also to Alexandra Drick for her testimony. Ireland continues to be disturbed by the continuing shelling of areas containing civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. The first six months of war have already seen over 12 million Ukrainians forced from their homes, creating a displacement crisis of enormous proportions. These are not just static numbers stemming from the first weeks of the war. The number of internally displaced persons rose by 330,000 just this past month. Nor are these merely statistics. We are talking about children, the elderly, the infirm, those with disabilities. Vulnerable people caught up in a situation beyond their control seeking shelter and safety, just as we would do. This makes the structure of the, of the infrastructure they depend on all the more abhorrent. 
On the 24th of August, a missile attack near a train station in Chapligny killed at least 25 people, including children, leading to yet more lives lost in an illegal war. An illegal war. Members of this council have recalled many times in the past six months that parties to conflict must comply with international humanitarian law, including the obligation to distinguish between civilians and combatants. We condemn indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks. There are no excuses and there are no exceptions. Mr. President, this is why we once again call on Russia to comply with all its obligations. There must be full, safe and unhindered humanitarian access to civilians, including those who choose to remain in Ukraine or who are unable to leave. They are not combatants and they must be protected. Those who seek to leave or those who are forced to leave must be allowed to do so safely and be allowed to leave for destinations of their own choosing. I repeat, of their own choosing. We are appalled by the evidence of horrific violations occurring in Ukraine. The UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission and the OSCE have documented cases of enforced deportations, arbitrary detentions, abductions, torture, and summary executions. There is evidence of enforced deportations of Ukrainians, including of children, to areas of Ukraine occupied by Russia or to the Russian Federation, and the worrying use of so-called filtration centers as part of this process. These violations of international humanitarian and human rights law may constitute international crimes, including war crimes. It is critical that access is granted to the United Nations to all these filtration centres. We know that displacement and conflict increases the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence. Indeed, this Council has previously heard horrendous reports of sexual violence perpetrated by Russian soldiers against women and girls, men and boys. But let us be clear, rape is not a given in war, but rather a deliberate act that may constitute a war crime and has lasting impacts on victims and survivors and their communities. There must be no impunity for such crimes. Mr. President, we are also very concerned by reports of the mistreatment of prisoners of war. All prisoners of war must be treated humanely in all circumstances in accordance with the Third Geneva Convention. Allegations or incidents of mistreatment must be properly investigated and perpetrators must be held accountable for violations. The International Committee of the Red Cross must be given access to all POWs. Finally, Mr. President, we are deeply disturbed by the disrespect for international humanitarian law in this war, and we are resolved to ensuring accountability for any international crimes taking place in Ukraine. We cannot and will not accept impunity for such crimes wherever they occur. Once again, Mr. President, we call on Russia to end its aggression, comply with its obligations under international law, and withdraw unconditionally from the entirety of the territory of Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie le représentant de l'Irlande de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole à la représentante des Émirats Arabes Unis. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd also like to thank our briefers, USG De Carlo and ASG Brands Karras, for their sobering updates. And I also take note of the briefing of Mr. Rick. Like many households in New York and around the world, many of us have been consumed this week with preparing for the start of the school year. This should be a joyful and exciting time for families and particularly for school children, which makes it very difficult to imagine it amidst the conflict we are discussing today or any other ongoing conflict around the world on this Security Council's agenda. The images of Ukrainian children back in their classrooms have been profoundly moving for the resilience they show, as the war has not spared some 2,300 educational institutions and destroyed 300, according to UN reports. The war in Ukraine has, like all wars, disproportionately affected women and children. At this particular time of the year, we recall UNICEF's estimates that over 2 million children have fled their country and many others have been internally displaced. Some might be able to attend virtual classes in Ukraine, but most will be in need of schools or daycare facilities in their new homes. At the same time, even those lucky enough to have a school to go to are grappling with social anxieties of integration and trauma.
The briefing of Ms. Keris on the protection of children is something the Ukrainian and Russian authorities should look into and rectify with urgency. It is an area where communication between the two parties is much needed and expected by the international community. If ever there was a clear-cut illustration of the need for a gender-responsive humanitarian approach, this is it. The Security Council should insist on tailor-made solutions by donors and humanitarian actors that specifically address the needs of Ukraine's women and children. In the face of these difficult challenges, we commend UNHCR as well as other UN agencies and humanitarian partners for their swift response to the needs of displaced people as well as to the host countries. As the conflict goes on, their generous protection and service delivery for those seeking refuge, including in education, becomes ever more vital. At the same time, we underline once again that such protection must be provided without prejudice or discrimination. Mr. President, those fleeing war are at their most vulnerable. In these conditions, it is key that they retain dignity and agency. Those seeking safety must be allowed safe and voluntary passage, and when circumstances allow, any return home should likewise be voluntary, safe, dignified, and durable. We reiterate that all parties must scrupulously abide by their obligations under international law, including those aspects of international humanitarian law addressing displacement. Since the start of the conflict, guaranteeing the safety of those fleeing has proven to be a particular challenge. With recent fighting intensifying in the areas surrounding Kherson, Kharkiv and Dnipro, routes to safety must be secured and humanitarian actors supporting evacuations must be protected. Meanwhile, reports of the destruction of water, electricity and gas infrastructure are once again leaving people in particularly vulnerable situations without access to life-sustaining services with the ongoing on approach of winter. We reiterate our call for the protection of civilians and for all civilian objects, including those indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, not to be targeted. As this conflict stretches on, the need to find a way to stem the suffering and stop the violence only deepens. We must redouble our efforts to support mitigation of the impacts of the conflict and gear us towards further confidence building measures. There is no other pathway forward. Over the last month, we have welcomed the resumption of agricultural exports from Ukraine as a result of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. But it is key that grain continues to reach those most in need, not just those able to pay. At the same time, we hope to see swift progress in getting Russian fertilizer out to the global markets as well. This is crucial for next year's harvest and to avoid the further deterioration of the current food crisis. Doing so will not only contribute to addressing the real needs of millions around the world, it may also create momentum for other tangible agreements to address the conflict. Mr. President, we continue to gather here and listen to the mounting costs of the war, and like all wars, the human costs will only worsen with every day that passes. But what is needed now are ideas and the political will to make them a reality. We saw this six weeks ago in a small way in Istanbul, and we must see it again. A cessation of hostilities would be the right starting point. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie la représentante des Émirats Arabes Unis de sa déclaration, et je donne à présent la parole à la représentante du Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie la secrétaire générale adjointe, Madame Rosemarie Di Carlo, la sous-secrétaire générale, Madame Brands Keris et Madame Drick pour leur exposé respectif sur la situation en Ukraine. Monsieur le Président, la guerre en Ukraine continue d'entraîner d'importants mouvements de personnes qui fuient la guerre avec des conséquences humanitaires de grande envergure. Malgré la forte mobilisation internationale, le bilan humanitaire de la guerre ne cesse de s'accroître avec le durcissement et l'intensification des combats. En dépit de quelques retours enregistrés, le nombre de personnes fuyant la guerre depuis le début des hostilités se compte à plus de 7 millions, au nombre desquelles des femmes, des enfants, des personnes âgées, des personnes vulnérables. 
Nous l'avons réitéré à chaque réunion de ce Conseil et nous, nous le redisons encore aujourd'hui avec le même engagement. Les civils paient un prix trop lourd alors que leur protection est garantie par les instruments juridiques internationaux, notamment les conventions de Genève et leurs protocoles additionnels. Les belligérants doivent s'y conformer. Monsieur le Président, six mois après le début de la guerre, alors que l'opinion publique internationale attend de ce Conseil des propositions concrètes de sortie du conflit, force est de constater que les partis demeurent toujours figés à leur antagonisme et aux échanges d'invectives. Nous devons envisager valablement une issue diplomatique à cette guerre meurtrière. Nous avons reçu avec un certain effroi les allégations faisant état de l'existence de camps de filtration et de recours au fichage aussi bien de civils que de prisonniers de guerre, assortis de mauvais traitements, de recours au travail forcé et de cas de torture. Il s'agit d'allégations particulièrement graves qui, si elles étaient avérées, seraient inconcevables et inacceptables. L'état de guerre n'est pas un état de droit et la détresse humaine ne peut être un objet de spéculation, de chantage ou d'échange. Il est particulièrement horrifiant de savoir que des enfants, dont le nombre se compte par, des, par centaines de milliers, seraient aussi concernés par ces traitements inhumains. Sur un sujet aussi grave, des enquêtes indépendantes et impartiales doivent être menées pour établir les faits et les responsabilités. Monsieur le Président, protéger les civils des affres de la guerre est une des vocations premières de ce Conseil, lorsqu'il a failli à la première, celle d'assurer la paix et la sécurité des peuples. Tous les mécanismes dont dispose le système multilatéral doivent être activés pour éviter d'ajouter l'inhumain à l'horreur de la guerre. Mon pays s'inscrira inlassablement dans le sens de la recherche de la paix et se tiendra aux côtés de ceux qui proposent des voies alternatives au langage assourdissant des bombes, des canons et des tirs d'artillerie. J'exhorte les partis à coopérer avec l'ONU et ses agences spécialisées pour assurer la protection des civils en Ukraine et au-delà. Les humanitaires doivent pouvoir accéder sans entrave aux localités et aux personnes qui ont besoin de secours. Nous exhortons également les belligérants à s'engager de bonne foi dans des négociations pour mettre un terme à la guerre et parvenir à une coexistence pacifique. Je salue à cet égard les négociations en cours entre les partis pour l'échange des prisonniers tout comme l'accord qui a permis l'exportation des céréales depuis les ports ukrainiens, il s'agit à nos yeux de lueurs d'espoir qui en appellent d'autres. Pour terminer, Monsieur le Président, je réitère l'appel de mon pays à l'ensemble des partis de mettre fin aux hostilités et de faire taire les armes. C'est le seul moyen d'éviter d'alourdir encore plus le bilan humanitaire de cette guerre. Je vous remercie. Je remercie la représentante du Gabon de sa déclaration. Je vais maintenant faire une déclaration en ma qualité de représentant de la France. Je remercie mesdames Di Carlo, Bronskeris et Drick pour leurs exposés. La guerre d'agression que conduit la Russie depuis bientôt plus de six mois en violation de tous les principes du droit international et de la charte a des conséquences dramatiques pour les populations civiles. En décidant d'attaquer l'Ukraine, la Russie savait quel lot de désolation elle allait amener. Si les conséquences de cette guerre illicite et injustifiée se font sentir partout dans le monde, la population ukrainienne est celle qui en paie le plus lourd tribut. 
je souhaite lui témoigner une nouvelle fois toute notre solidarité et saluer son courage dans la défense de son pays. La France est très préoccupée par les informations concernant le transfert forcé de civils ukrainiens vers des zones occupées par la Russie ou vers la Russie. Ces actes ont notamment été documentés par différents organes indépendants. Elles font état de civils ukrainiens, y compris des enfants, transférés de force vers des zones occupées par la Russie ou vers la Russie, alors qu'ils ne cherchaient qu'à fuir les hostilités. Les autorités russes auraient également soumis des civils ukrainiens dans des conditions de détention déplorables à des processus de filtrage. Toute la lumière doit être faite sur ces actes d'une extrême gravité qui, s'ils sont avérés, pourraient constituer des crimes de guerre et des crimes contre l'humanité. Depuis le début de la guerre d'agression lancée par la Russie, nous ne cessons de recevoir des témoignages de graves violations du droit international humanitaire et des droits de l'homme. Je tiens à le redire, les crimes commis en Ukraine font dans leur intégralité l'objet d'une documentation rigoureuse, de collecte de preuves et d'analyses criminalistiques qui permettront leur examen par la justice. Rien ne restera caché. Leurs auteurs devront rendre des comptes. Le travail de la Cour pénale internationale et de la Commission d'enquête internationale et indépendante créée par le Conseil des droits de l'homme est indispensable à cet effort de documentation, d'analyse et de lutte contre l'impunité. La France soutient leur action ainsi que les efforts déployés par les juridictions ukrainiennes dans le cadre des enquêtes qu'elles ont ouvertes. Elle restera aux côtés de ses partenaires et continuera à se mobiliser sans relâche. Je reprends mes fonctions de président du Conseil et je donne à présent la parole à la représentante de l'Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council. I also recognize here the representative of terrorist Russia in the permanent seat of the Soviet Union. I would like to thank Under Secretary General Rosemarie Di Carlo, Assistant Secretary General Ilze Brands Keris, and human rights expert Alexandra Drieg for their substantive and truthful presentations. The horrific facts on human sufferings from the Russian occupiers brought to our attention has again proved that the only option to end this war is to hold the aggressor accountable for its criminal actions. Criminal indeed due to both the huge record of crimes in the occupied territories of Ukraine and the criminal background of many Russian soldiers recruited recently for the war against Ukraine. The story of Russian murderer Neparatov is one of the many highlights the level of degradation of Russian armed forces. Back in 2013, this person was a leader of a gang sentenced to 25 years in prison for killing five people and armed assaults. The murderer joined the Russian occupation forces in Donbas, was killed in a short while, and then awarded with Russia high military decoration. No moral constraints, readiness to kill, and to terrorize civilians. These are the personal welcomed now by the Russian military recruiters. This is the face of Russian army. Mr. President, today, almost 200 year, uh, days since the invasion started, we are more than confident in the victory of Ukraine. Despite the fact that the enemy is still on our land, despite that we still have a long way to go to liberate the entire territory, we have no doubt it will happen. In fact, it is happening now. Over the recent days, the Ukrainian forces liberated territories and settlements in Kherson, Kharkiv, and Donetsk regions. The Russian occupation forces consider terrorizing local population to be an important part of their attempts to prepare the ground for fake referendums. <laughs> 
but broad, active and passive resistance in the occupied territories, disdained by the local population towards occupiers, small number of collaborators, and first and foremost, intensive actions by the Ukrainian armed forces have already forced Russia to abandon its plans to hold such referendum in September as earlier planned by Russia, by Moscow. We have no doubt that they will fail with any new deadline as well. Distinguished members of the Security Council, as a part of its aggression, Russia continues forcible deportation of Ukrainian citizens to its territory. Our people are being transferred to isolated and depressed regions of Siberia and the Far East. The scale of this crime is outrageous. According to available data, nearly 2.5 million Ukrainians, including about 38,000 children, have been transferred from southern and eastern regions of Ukraine. Blocking evacuation to the mainland Ukraine, Russia simply leaves for the population of the occupied areas no other choice but to go to the Russian territory or the occupied Crimea. Russia is indeed the biggest recipient of forceful deportation of Ukrainians. As a part of the forced evacuation and deportation, Russia detained refugees in so-called filtration camps. These extra-legal facilities have been widely used by Russia to terrorize the civilian population under the pretext of identifying dangerous persons. In reality, those whom the occupiers suspect of disloyalty because of their political views or potential affiliation with the Ukrainian army, government, media, civil society groups, disappear after so-called filtration in the gray zone of occupied Donetsk and Luhansk. Families are separated, children are grabbed away from parents. According to the OHCHR report, such persons were later held in tragically known Olenivka, where 53 Ukrainian prisoners of wars were brutally killed by Russia, and in Donetsk. Many detainees were reportedly tortured and some of them summarily executed. The so-called filtration camps have been also set up in the cities of Makivka, Snizhne, Torets, Shakhtarsk, Khartsysk, Novozovsk, Berdyansk, the villages of Nikolske, Bezimenne, Yurivka. According to Ministry of Reintegration, temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine, that only about 16,000 deported citizens were able to return to Ukraine. According to their accounts, most of those transferred to Russia face lack of means and absence of travel documents. This makes dozens of thousand people wishing to return back home literally trapped in Russia. Mr. President, it is a back to, back to school time in most of our states. Regrettably, the school year in Ukraine has started against the backdrop of rocket and artillery shellings by Russia with education facilities being a regular target. Since the beginning of invasion, the Russian forces have damaged 2,177 educational institutions, leaving 284 totally destroyed. Due to the security threats, only 56% educational institutions are prepared to provide in-person learning for their students. Primary concern is that Russia attempts to expand its practices of militarization and russification of education to the territories it has occupied since February. It focuses on erasing the Ukrainian ethnic identity. According to available data, about 200,000 children of school age remain in the occupied territories. Principals and school staff in the occupied territories are subject to pressure and intimidation aimed at enforcing them to follow Russian school programs. Needless to say, the curriculum that Russia tries to impose in the occupied territories of Ukraine does not provide the study of the Ukrainian language and literature as well as the history of Ukraine. As most of Ukrainian teachers in the occupied territories refuse to collaborate, the Russian occupiers try to substitute the local staff with that coming from Russia. Distinguished colleagues, Children from the occupied territories are transferred to Russia and illegally given up for adoption. The forcible transfer of children of one group to another with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group 
is a violation of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. On August 23, the Krasnodar Department of Family and Childhood in the Russian Federation publicly reported that over 1,000 Ukrainian children from Mariupol were illegally transferred to outsiders in Tumen, Irkutsk, Kemerovo, and Altai regions. More than 300 children are currently being held in specialized institutions in Krasnodar region. We reiterate that all Ukrainian children who were illegally displaced to the territory of Russia must be returned to their parents or legal guardians. Until this happens, this crime needs most powerful response by the international community. Mr. President, facing the existential threat to the state and the people, Ukraine continues contributing to averting the global food crisis and fulfilling in good faith its obligations for the Grain Export Initiative. As of now, more than 90 ships have already been sent from Ukrainian ports. And in general, more than 2 million tons of our food have already been exported by the sea from the Ukrainian ports. But as long as Russia is able to continue its aggression against Ukraine on land and sea, the global security threats and food crisis would remain fragile. Distinguished colleagues, such modern evil has to be disarmed fully in order to prevent the repetition of violence and bloodshed. This is key lesson drawn from the Second World War that started 83 years ago on 1st September 1939. People believed that it would be possible to avoid the repetition of those terrible crimes and such a cruel war. But the similar morning happened again for millions of Ukrainians on 24th February 2022. Once again, aggressor tries to size territories in Europe through mass murder and terror by exploiting the ideology of hatred. But there is something that did not happen again. There were no pacts with aggressor. From the very beginning of the war, we have received real help from true friends all around the world. Russia's capacities to wage a war has been limited by sanction packages, and we urge the international community to further expand this practice that literally saves the lives of Ukrainian people. As President Zelensky said on the occasion of the anniversary of the Second World War, I quote, we will do everything to ensure that Ukrainians and other nations throughout the globe live freely. We will do everything to ensure that the morning of September 1st, the morning of June 22nd, and the morning of February 24th do not repeat, never again. We will do everything to make hatred finally lose. I thank you. Je remercie la représentante de l'Ukraine de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de l'Italie. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, let me also thank the briefers, uh, USG Di Carlo, uh, ASG. Gans Kegis and Madame Drake uh, uh, for their alarming but very effective description of one of the darkest sides of this war. As we reiterated multiple times, Russian aggression on Ukraine is a blatant violation of international law. However, the filtration system of Ukrainian civilians we have heard about uh, today is a violation of the use in Bello as profound as we have not witnessed in Europe since World War II. It was indeed to avoid these horrors that the international community gathered in Geneva in 1949, adopting the four conventions we all know. It is uh, thus crucial to reiterate once again the prohibition of forcible transfers of civilians from the occupied territory to the occupying power's territory regardless of the motive. In addition to this uh, already grave breach of um, international humanitarian law, which could be prosecuted as a war crime and a crime against humanity by the International Criminal Court, credible sources have also raised awareness of potential cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, illegal biometric data collection, torture, arbitrary detentions, and enforced disappearances. These are all disrespects of the most basic human rights, despite all the disinformation attempts. 
Mr. President, these crimes are not only a violation of the international legal framework, they are also an offense to the shared values and principles upon which the United Nations are built on. The seriousness of this situation requires two swift and crucial actions in order to end the unacceptable and inhuman conditions in which thousands of innocent Ukrainian citizens find themselves as we speak. First, we call on Russia to grant unfettered access to both UN bodies and international NGOs, such as the ICRC, to freely and safely visit the temporary replacement centers with direct and complete access to these civilians, in line with the Geneva Conventions. Secondly, we call on Russia to ensure the immediate return of all forcibly transferred Ukrainian citizens, particularly women and children, to their territories of origin and their full freedom of movement towards third countries. In this sense, Italy believes that the effective evacuation mechanism established in Mariupol, thanks to the coordination efforts of the UN and ICRC, is a clear example of how international humanitarian law cannot be left only to the voluntary compliance of armed and non-armed groups, it should be replicated to, the, to end this heinous filtration system. Mr. President, let me conclude by pointing out that we must also be sure that these crimes will not happen again. In this perspective, Italy highlights the urge to guarantee accountability for the perpetrators of such severe breaches of international humanitarian law. It affirms its full support for the work of independent international and domestic fora investigating to avoid any form of impunity and support the, the further strengthening of the existing mechanism of compliance, particularly the International Criminal Court. I thank you. Je remercie le représentant de l'Italie de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Pologne. Monsieur le Président, I wish to thank you for organizing this briefing to discuss yet another disturbing aspect of the war in Ukraine. I also thank the briefers for their insightful remarks and alarming information. It is a tragic yet a true fact that every conflict brings terrible suffering to the civilians. After the Second World War, we know it in Poland too well. The Russian aggression against Ukraine is no exception. Deliberate attacks against civilian population have forced millions of Ukrainians to seek shelter outside their home country. The evidence emerged that in their attempts to flee the territories occupied by Russia, they have been faced with yet another dire choice that we just heard from the Ukrainian representative, or in fact with no choice at all, to leave Ukraine for Russia or not to leave at all. As it was already signaled by the Ukrainian administration and further confirmed by the recent Human Rights Watch report, forced transfers of civilians from Donetsk and Lugansk regions and the overrun uh, city of Mariupol into the territory of Russian Federation have been conducted by the Russian or Russian-affiliated troops and officials. Mr. Chair, we express our grave concern about the deportation of civilians to Russia. We are also deeply worried of, by the establishment of the so-called filtration centers for the people evacuated from the besieged or temporarily occupied territories. The accounts of those who were subjected to forced transfers and filtration processes are horrifying. These practices bring to mind the Stalinist method. Uh, the, their systematic character leads us to assume that they might have been premeditated. This practice constitutes another attempt by the Kremlin to eliminate Ukrainian people physically and to destroy their distinct identity. And the Kremlin would never succeed in that, of course. Information about Ukrainian children transferred to Russia are particularly disturbing. Such actions constitute a violation of both the UN Genocide Convention and the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Protection of the most vulnerable and def defenseless victims of war remains Poland's priority. And we call the uh, international community to hold the perpetrators accountable and to protect Ukrainian children's right to identity, including their nationality, without unlawful interference. Mr. Chair, the forced transfers are yet another element of the long list of serious violations of the Russian by the Russian Federation of the laws of the war that amount to war crimes and even crimes against humanity. It is all the more deplorable that the Russian Federation is presenting Ukrainians entering its territory, voluntarily or not, as refugees or migrants, 
whereas they are in fact the victims of the Russian violations of the international law. For these reasons, accountability for violations of the international law, including the human rights law committed by, in Ukraine by the Russian Federation, should remind our priority. Poland has consistently called for bringing perpetrators of the said atrocities to justice. We continue to support the work of the fact-finding and investigate and accountability mechanism mandated by the relevant international organization to examine these violations. We have supported the establishment of this dedicated Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry. We, are, we were also part of the broad group of Organization for Security and Cooperation Europe, participating states, which twice evoked OSC Moscow mechanism to examine the violations of the international law and the human rights law caused by the Russian Federation and, the, and in its aggression. Monsieur le Président, Poland once again strongly urges the Russian Federation to stop its war of choice and to fully withdraw all its forces from the territory of, to, of Ukraine. We call upon Russia to respect the international law and the humanitarian law, and in particular to stop the practice of illegal force transfers and to allow all civilians transferred out of Ukraine to live in the direction they wish. And I thank you. Merci. Je remercie euh, le représentant de la Pologne de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Slovaquie. Thank you, Mr. President. Despite many calls of the international community, the Russian Federation Constitute continues to pursue its unjustified and unprovoked aggression against Ukraine in blatant violations of international law. We are concerned about Russia's intention to stage fraudulent referendums with the aim of illegally annexing the occupied territories of Ukraine. These anticipated steps follow the same tactic the Russian Federation used in 2014 with regard to Crimea. Slovakia does not and will not recognize such an illegal annexation violating fundamental principles of international law. We seize this opportunity to reiterate once again that the aggressor accountable for this situation is evident, and we call for an immediate cessation of Russian military activities in Ukraine and unconditional withdrawal of all Russian troops from the whole territory of Ukraine. We are concerned about numerous reports that since the beginning of the senseless war of choice, the Russian Federation's officials, as well as officials affiliated to the Russian Federation, have been forcibly transferring Ukrainian civilians to areas of occupied territories of Ukraine and to the Russian Federation. This action is not only deplorable and immoral, but may also constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. Mr. President, according to those reports, during the process of filtration, citizens of Ukraine are subject to compulsory security screening with collecting civilians' biometric data, conducting body searches, and questioning them about political views. This process, violating multiple human rights, is moreover conducted in inhuman conditions. There is also serious information that individuals failing the filtration process were detained and whereabouts and fate of some of those detained remain unknown. In this regard, there are serious grounds for concerns that these individuals are at particular risk of torture and deprivation of their lives. We call on the Russian Federation to cease such an activity at once and allow all civilians forcibly transferred who wish to return to Ukraine to do so. Last but not least, we deplore once again propaganda and false narrative we heard today by the Russian Federation under the pretext of humanity. I thank you. Je remercie le représentant de la Slovaquie de sa déclaration et je donne à présent la parole au représentant de la Lettonie. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm speaking on behalf of the three Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, and my own country, Latvia. We welcome this meeting on forcibly transfer or deportations of civilians in Ukraine. And we thank the Under Secretary Di Carlo, Assistant Secretary General Brands Kechris, and Mrs. Drick for their thorough presentations. For almost 200 days, Russia, aided by Belarus, 
continues this brutal war of aggression in blatant violation of international law by violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and by terrorizing and committing atrocities against civilians. We have repeatedly underlined that Russia started this war and only Russia can end it by completely and unconditionally withdrawing its tro troops from Ukraine's internationally recognized territory, as well as by implementing with immediate effect the provisional measures ordered by the International Court of Justice and complying with the UN General Assembly resolutions of the 2nd and 24th of March this year. As per the latest reports of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, a total more than 5,700 civilian deaths are documented in Ukraine, underlying that OHSR believes that the actual figures are considerably higher. Moreover, the number of dead and injured civilians is growing every day since new crimes against civilians are discovered and new attacks on civilians are executed regularly by the Russian military. Mr. President, we call on Russia to immediately stop violating international humanitarian law and human rights of people of Ukraine. We strongly condemn the forced passportization and conscription of the Russian armed forces in the Russian armed forces, the citizens of Ukraine, who live in the temporarily occupied territories. We strongly condemn deportation of Ukrainian civilians to Russia, forcibly transferring of children, illegal adoption of Ukrainian children, as well as abduction of civilians, including majors and other democratically elected representatives, journalists and activists. According to various credible government, non-governmental and international organization reports, Russia has forcibly transferred over 1.7 million Ukrainians to Russia, including over 240,000 children. Russia's forces have set up almost 20 so-called filtration camps or centers in temporarily controlled Ukraine territory. Ukrainians who have endured these camps have reported treatments ranging from humiliation to verbal abuse and physical torture, including strip searches, confiscation, and search through the electronic devices, use of electric shocks, and even staged mock executions of detainees. Such vulnerable groups as women, children, orphans, and elderly have suffered the most. There is clear and undeniable evidence that Russia is deporting Ukrainian civilians. Even Russia itself has admitted to forcibly transferring Ukrainian civilians. In May, a Russian official acknowledged that 1,426,979 people, of which 238,329 are children, had been evacuated from dangerous areas of the Republic of Donbas in Ukraine to the territory of the Russian Federation. We would like to recall that the former High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations told the Human Rights Council that her office is looking into allegations that children in orphanages had been taken to Russia. We, take, we thank ASG Ilze Brans-Kerchis for the detailed report today, and we call on the international human rights organizations to continue documenting cases of forcible transfer of Ukrainian citizens, providing regular and public reports about their findings. Similar to the fact-finding missions regarding the massacre of Ukrainian prisoners of war in Olenivka, we call on the UN to establish a fact-finding mission to document deportation of Ukrainian citizens. Mr. President, we must make no mistake. Russia's warfare against the civilian population of Ukraine is not a coincidence or collateral damage. It is a deliberate and consistent approach throughout Russia's continued aggression aimed at breaking the resistance and spirit of Ukrainian people. Unable to defeat Ukraine in the battlefield, Russia's military seeks to achieve its aims by terrorizing Ukraine's civilian population. This is the high time for international community to demonstrate that the norms aimed at protection of civilians are not empty statements that can be trampled down by dictators and bullies, but ironclad, obli ironclad obligation which we are collectively determined to uphold. We must ensure accountability at all levels for atrocities committed against Ukraine and its peoples, including deportations. It is of utmost importance to continue to provide all necessary support in this regard. Justice must prevail. The perpetrators must and will be accountable. And thank you, Mr. President.
Je remercie le représentant de la Lettonie pour sa déclaration. Il n'y a plus d'oratrice ou d'orateur inscrit sur la liste. La séance est levée.